<laughs> always well, always happy to come back. All right. So I want to welcome everyone to Meg's Point Nature Center's Native American Experiences uh, program with Dr. Nick Bellantoni. I want to let everybody know that we will have other programs like this coming up. So keep an eye on our website and on our Facebook page, and you will see uh, additional programs. This video uh, is being recorded and we'll put it up uh, on the website with some additional uh, content. So if you visit the Meg's Point Nature Center uh, website, megspointnaturecenter.org, and go to the Virtual Learning Center, you will get to see not only this video, but all of the videos that we've done. And we always try and add a little something to the video. So something downloadable, a word search, or a crossword puzzle, or maybe a vocabulary list, something like that, to add to the experience of the video. So without any uh, further ado, I will give it off to uh, Dr. Nick Bellantoni for today's presentation. Thanks, Russ, and uh, thank you all for tuning in. Listen, it's a dreary, if you're in the Northeast, it's a pretty dreary and wet day, so uh, hopefully uh, coming in and uh, spending some time with us will be uh, better than being in a rain, uh, I would say. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to share my screen, so hopefully you will all be able to see it, and I'm going to put on a, 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 a slideshow for you. Let me just get the whole thing up, and hopefully you could see that and hear me, and we're ready to go. So we're going to be talking about Native American uh, adaptation along the Connecticut shoreline. Um, and really, it's, it's a, a very complicated um, uh, adaptation uh, that we see from the archaeological record has changed from 12,000 years ago because of changing environments from the glacial period to the warming condition until uh, actually also the, the advent of Europeans coming on our shores. So the Native American adaptation is complex. It's, it's tied into the environment in terms of what changes are occurring. And um, so I can only give you 12,000 years and you know, as, um, as expeditiously as I can. Uh, but hopefully you'll get a good impression in, in, uh, of what was going on. I, first of all, I just want to uh, dedicate this presentation to the memory of uh, a dear friend, Dr. Don Rankin. You see him here with Ranger Russ, uh, who's a big supporter of the Meg's Point Nature Center, as well as Hayman Asset State Park. But some of you may not know that Don was a big supporter of um, archaeology in the state of Connecticut, as well as Native American history. We miss him greatly. I know you all do that are associated with him and acid, and we certainly want to dedicate this to his memory, a dear friend and a great supporter. So when we talk about New England Native American adaptation along the coast, again, it's a very complex thing. They were very tied into understanding the environment and, you know, in ways we are just trying to learn about, you know, you, many of you have gone on, uh, you know, tours with Ranger Ross and, uh, and others around the, uh, 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 Rangers with, uh, deep around the state. And you learn and you kind of relearn, the ecology, relearn about the plants and animals that were here. And um, of course, Native Americans were very, very much tied into that whole system. Um, very, very, for in, in terms of uh, just economics, uh, um, but understood the system in ways that we are just relearning. Uh, so when we talk about 12,000 years, how, how do we know? I mean, how do we come to understand 12,000 years of adaptation? And so I just want to give you a little moment of uh, introduction. Uh, we do it through archaeological research, what archaeological evidences we have that come out of the ground and allow us to interpret the past. We also learn from ethno-historical records, and that is when the earliest English in the 17th century came here, um, first through trade and then settlement, what they wrote about 
Native Americans and their villages and how they adapted. Um, there was quite an interest, even though we do look at that record and understand the biases that were sometimes implicit in the writing, but it is a, an important source of our information. And then finally, we have Native American oral traditions themselves, uh, traditions that have been handed down to the, to the generations to this day uh, uh, among uh, uh, the coastal and uh, uh, tribes like the, the Mohegans, the, uh, the Pequots, uh, Mashatucket and, uh, and Eastern, as well as the Pagussets um, a lot in the Bridgeport area. So we have oral traditions, we have written history, and we have archaeology. Now, because I'm an archaeologist, uh, we're going to really concentrate on what the archaeological record has, has uh, 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 taught us about Native American history and adaptation. And again, this is get in the ground, dig it out, dirt archaeology, but not just excavating, you know, with a shovel flipping dirt. It's ex excavating in a controlled way so that basically archaeology is a, is a scientific method to study the past. And what we do here is called anthropological archeology. span That means to say, you know, we're not interested in collecting artifacts. This is not to collect arrowheads. This is to understand human behavior of the past. And the way we do that is through the material culture that has left us to interpret through scientific process. Uh, so we wanna record and interpret cultural life ways of the past, whether it's our own past, the Native Americans, um, you know, African Americans, uh, everyone that has settled in the place called Connecticut uh, historically, um, and the evidences they have left behind, which sometimes, you know, we will argue the archaeological record contributes to the historic record, but in very unique ways, and sometimes even changes what we know about the past. So the archaeological record comes in three forms, artifacts, features, and compiled into archeological sites. An artifact is simply the raw material archeological, uh, archeologists use to study. It's material culture, it's things you have, it's the clothes you wear, the computer you're watching this on, um, you know, or, or, or the stone tool that, that uh, a Native American at Hammond may have used thousands of years ago. Um, it's any object that was made by humans or owes its place uh, to human action. So what's important about our study of artifacts is that artifacts that we have are simply manifestations of our cultural behavior, our belief systems, our ideas, our technology, all get caught into that. Um, you know, the Puritans that came here in the 17th century had a concept of an a kind of angry God, uh, and it was sinful to expose, you know, your skin uh, and so when you look at their clothing, it covered, even in our stifling summers, covered every bit of them. So it, their clothing was not just a, a matter of the technology of, you know, weaving. And, uh, uh, it's also a manifestation of their belief systems. And it's the same with us. We've become a very informal culture in the late 20th and early 21st century. Uh, you know, people uh, have tried to go into the Vatican in tank tops and shorts because we are so people used to go to baseball games in, in, in jackets and men would have jackets and ties on uh, to go to a baseball game. We wouldn't think of that today. Uh, so what we do is we look at artifacts, we tear them apart, examine attributes like this clay uh, Native American pot from from Connecticut. Uh, and what I mean by the attributes is not only the, the clay, the temper, but also the motifs, the designs that are put into them, because that's what really reflects sometimes tribal associations, family associations, belief systems, ideas, all get played into that. So it's not about collecting artifacts. It's about understanding what the artifacts teach us and they about past lives and also our lives today. And archaeological features are important to our story of coastal adaptations because one of the things we find like here in this feature, um, and features could be stains in the ground, they could be storage pits, they could be shell middens. Um, what we see in this feature, you could see in this, in this photograph, if you could follow my, uh, uh, my cursor, you could see the change in the soil and you could see in this vertical cut, these white deposits, what those are, shellfish, shellfish from an archeological site 
that dates to over 3,000 years ago that were deposited or dumped after the original New England clam bakes, <laughs> some of which occurred at Hammond Acid. Um, but what's important here about these refuse pits, they don't give a lot of artifacts, but what they do give are foodstuffs, the shell, the bones of, of the animals, botanicals, charred nuts, seeds that were used, and being able to radiocarbon date these, say to a certain time period, allows us to reconstruct not only the diets of people, but what the environment was like. What was the world like 3,000 years ago? What was Connecticut like, the coastline, Hemanasset? You can get to that through an understanding of the plants and animals that were here then, and the availability of foodstuffs for native peoples. And it also teaches us what they selected, what resources were important for them. Were there certain species of animals? Were there certain environmental niches that were important? Um, and certainly what these things show is a diversity of faunal and floral exploitation. Um, native peoples understood the environment uh, and understood how to survive as the environments changed. And the other thing we get in these middens and these features are great shell preservation and great organic preservation. And what I mean by that is Connecticut has very acidic soils naturally. We have a mixed deciduous environment with a lot of precipitation. Our soils are relatively low on the pH scale, very acidic, which means organic remains in the soil like bone and wood do not survive very well. They do not survive very long. However, where there have been deposits of shell, like in these middens, shell, when it disintegrates, uh, releases uh, calcium carbonates into the soil uh, and neutralize the soil acidity. So kind of like when you take a Tums because you have uh, acid indigestion, uh, the Tums releases calcium carbonate that allows you some relief. Well, what it does is it makes preservation of organic remains in the ground better. We get actually fish scales survive, small bits of botanicals, and it allows us again to understand the full exploitation around the coast. So sometimes these archaeological features are, are you know, more telling than just simply artifacts because they can help us reconstruct the diets and the environments of the past. So when we're dealing with the coast, well, we have two kinds of sites. We have terrestrial sites on the ground that we excavate down to in systematic controlled ways, setting up a grid so that we can keep vertical and horizontal controls because it's really the mapping and the associations that really allow us the ability to interpret those sites. But we also have underwater sites along our coast. And while many people associate underwater archeology span with shipwrecks, historic shipwrecks, and we do have our share in Long Island Sound, there are also submerged Native American sites because since the glacial period, sea levels have been rising, which means Native American sites along the coast have been inundated, okay? So there's an underwater archeology span associated with that. So to really tell the story, we have to go back to the Ice Age. We have to go back here two to three million years ago during a, a geological period known as the Pleistocene, where there was a diversity of plants and animals, but many of which were associated with large game animals, large animals, um, mastodons and, uh, and uh, uh, um, caribou and so forth. Um, the, the diversity under the ice was, um, quite of uh, plants that were quite extensive. However, Connecticut was 18,000 years ago uh, and, and earlier uh, covered by a, a massive glacier, a mile high at least, and completely covered the state. And it was an active glacier that scoured with recessions and advances, scoured the landscape. Um, the last re uh, extent of that is, is called the, the Wisconsin glaciation was started over, you know, it was about for a period of time of 125,000 years. It reached its peak around 18,000 years ago when it started to recede with the warming temperatures. And you can see if you follow my cursor and uh, the schematic, you know, it covered right through Long Island and Connecticut, completely covered by the glacier. When it's melting, and you know, Connecticut becomes ice-free about 15,000 years ago, which 
you know, leads to erosion and redepositing of soils and, and glacial debris. So the landscape was completely different and the coast was completely different. This is another schematic showing glacial lakes at that time. So once the, the glacial waters get trapped, they form lakes. So the Champlain Sea, for example, is the remnant of that today is Lake Champlain, um, much reduced from that. But the Hudson River Valley, much of that was part of Lake Albany. And Connecticut was covered by a, gla a lake called gl Glacial Lake Hitchcock that extended almost all the way to Canada, the whole Connecticut River Valley. It dammed up around, there was a natural dam around uh, Rocky Hill, Middletown, Connecticut, and held back the waters until the waters would eventually fill and break. But one of the most important glacial lakes is Glacial Lake, Connecticut. That's important because as we look for Native American sites in the early time periods, Long Island Sound was in fact a freshwater lake. It's not until the glaciers recede to the point where the ocean's water rises to the uh, to the extent that on the eastern end of Long Island, it inundates, the, the ocean inundates, invades into this glacial lake. No longer fresh water, it is now brackish, it is now salt water, it is now Long Island Sound. So that means, as archaeologists, if we were to want to find maybe some of the earliest adaptations, well, the Connecticut coast back here, as you can see, where Glacial Lake Hitchcock is on the left, that's just a freshwater inland lake. To go to the ocean, you had to go out over a hundred miles along the continental shelf to where the coastline was. As the water kept rising, this coastline gets pushed back and Native American adaptation keeps moving with it. So in other words, there are probably sites out here under the submerge of the Atlantic Ocean that were once um, land and where Native Americans may have occupied. So as the sea levels rise, Long Island Sound gets filled with marine water. That happens, you know, about 5,000 years ago or so. But what happens also is that we start seeing a sea level rise stability. This slide, by the way, is wrong. It's not 45,000 years ago. It's about 5,000, four to four to 5,000 years ago. So I apologize to that. What's important is about four to 5,000 years ago, it stabilizes. So you can see in our chart here, it, it, it's, it's inundating very quickly in the post-glacial time and kind of slows down. It's still rising. You know it's still rising today with uh, global uh, climate change, um, actually more dramatically than it was even back then in 5,000, 3,000, 2,000 years ago. Um, but what that means is when the coast stabilizes, then shellfish populations and other uh, uh, you know, maritime uh, resources uh, like salt marshes and so forth start to stabilize and allows for greater adaptation by native peoples uh, at that time. So I don't know a better example of this kind of uh, uh, um, a sea level rise and Native American uh, uh, adaptation than Hammond Asset State Park itself. And I, I, I tell you this story because uh, in 1955, those of you that are my age and older will remember that there was a, 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 a terrible storm system that came through the Northeast. Um, it, it caused tremendous rains, flooding, um, you know, uh, part of uh, the Army Corps dam system that we have today along our rivers was really started because of the devastation of this storm system. But one of the things it did is it entered into New England, it, it destroyed the beach at Hammond Acid State Park. So much so they had to close the park because of flooding and, and the destruction of the beach. Once everything settled down, the state of Connecticut went back to restore the beach for recreational purposes. So they went out into Long Island Sound, probably about 60 to 100 feet, and started to dredge up sand, spewing it onto the beach to restore the beach for, pre for recreational purposes. Well, what ended up happening is 
they can't they um, dredged with it an underwater pre-contact Native American site that dated to about four to five thousand years ago. So what they did is they they not only spewed sand onto the beach but Native American artifacts. So people were coming, you know, spreading their blankets, enjoying the, the Hymenacid State Park beach. And they were finding stone tools uh, associated with them. They were finding, you know, bits of charcoal, stone tools on the beach surface. And they would report it to the rangers and so forth. And what had happened again is that site is now submerged under the water, the dredging, push the artifacts up onto the beach surface. So it teaches us that under the coast, under the, what is now inundated, are part of this story that is you know, a little bit more difficult to get to, but underwater archeology span is, is doing their best to be able to, to locate them um, uh, very dramatically. So if we go back to that paleo period, that first peopling 12,000 years ago, the deglaciation of the, 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 the Wisconsin glaciation. You know, the first people came in, you know, at about that time. And we, it could have been here, you know, even earlier, um, but this is the archaeological evidence we have. They came in small nomadic groups, um, you know, shifting if they were along the coast to the in as the sea levels rose. And when we look at the distribution of archaeological sites, we find them, you know, in the river valleys, uh, around formal glacial lake basins. And, you know, they hunted mastodon, uh, elephant-like creatures here. We have six archaeological sites, actually paleontological sites, that have the remains of uh, mastodons that have been recovered. And I'll tell you a good story. One time, this is many, many years ago, when I was state archaeologist before I retired, uh, 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 got a call from a fisherman. Guy was out beyond Long Island um, in the Atlantic Ocean, setting his nets, dredging uh, for fish for his occupation. Well, not only did he get fish in his net, but he got this big, white, pitted uh, artifact. He had no idea what it was with these little tiny projections from it. And he was uh, curious enough to, to call us at Yukon, brought, brought, brought it up. And what he had found um, was a molar uh, of a mastodon. Now, um, if you follow my uh, cursor again on the screen, um, it was from the mandible or lower jaw of a mastodon. Uh, you know, and it was a, about the size of a football. And I explained to him what it was. And the first thing he said to me was, what's the elephant doing in the ocean? And I had explained to him, when that Macedon was on the landscape, that was not ocean. That was uh, uh, dry land. So again, uh, to understand the first peopling, we have to understand the environment. It was barren back there after glaciation gradually filling in with more plants and animals, a tundra environment at first. Um, and the climate was obviously a lot colder and variable and the sea levels were a lot lower. And people adapted. You know, we sometimes overestimate, emphasize the hunting because we find the stone tools, but they were generalists. And, uh, you know, they, they, they hunted, they gathered, they fished. Uh, we don't know much about their shelters, but we know more about their plants. But when you look at the uh, locations we have now, this is an uh, you know an old map that we put together many many years ago um, of Connecticut, but of Paleo Indian uh, sites. You see almost nothing around the coast, and that's simply because um, the coast was changing so much, uh, and um, uh, and until it stabilizes during the period we call the archaic, that um, we start seeing more adaptation uh, along that way. So the archaic period starts about 9,000 years ago. It's a long lasting period to about 3,000 years ago, but it comes along with warmer environment. It, we're now in a geological period called the Holocene. Things have warmed up. As a result, the reindeer have moved out, searching for the tundra up north. Uh, you know, we now get, uh, instead of a spruce park 
the forest. We get a mixed deciduous forest that you and I are more familiar with. Uh, and, 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 and native peoples have more resources to stay in this one area. So they're less nomadic um, using local courts, uh, uh, um, the stone technology uh, with their bone and, 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 uh, and wood. Uh, populations increase. We see a diversity of kind of sites, not just campsites now, but villages, uh, not villages, but you know, base camps, large camps. Uh, and smaller uh, uh, temporary camps, but far more complex and populations uh, staying on the landscape. So now when we look at these sites, and again, this is outdated, but we start seeing more around the coast and uh, certainly the major river areas. And what we start now seeing is the development of shell middens. Uh, and that is to say that first New England clam bakes with the stabilization now of the, of the, of the, of, of the, the coastline, you know, shellfish uh, uh, now start to proliferate and they were very easy. You can get shell all year long. It wasn't a seasonal product. Um, and so what we see are these large, very deep shell middens uh, that are just basically refuse deposits uh, that, that uh, Native Americans in using uh, shell and other uh, material discarded their garbage, uh, sometimes over a, 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 a contour, uh, you know, uh, at the side of the, of the, the base camp. Um, and some of these grow very thick. In fact, uh, archaeologists from Yale University back at the turn of the 20th century uh, did a study of, of shellmans along the New England coast from, from like New York uh, up to Maine. And one of them states that the largest shell midden they had ever seen was actually from Brantford, Connecticut, what we call today Indian Neck area of along the, the coast in the mouth of the Brantford River. So again, you know, these are very important because uh, they provide excellent organic preservation and our abilities to interpret um, what food sources they're getting. Uh, for, for, for example, um, when you excavate these sites, sometimes you get stratigraphic differences in, in the time frames. Um, and you might see, for example, one of the things we see about 4,000 years ago, there's an extensive use of cod um, um, and bluefish. Um, uh, and then uh, later on, we see more extensive inland resource, uh, 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 inland coastal, like, like um, uh, uh, flounder. Uh, and, and, and so forth. So there's changes uh, sometimes, and it could be over exploitation. It could be a number of different reasons. But the fact is, we see changes in the uses of certain plants and animals uh, that are now available uh, to them. They're, they're selecting within their within their environment. And so when it comes to the coast, one of the things uh, that have been found um, are fish weirs, uh, many of which were made of, of wood. There's a very famous one came out of uh, uh, Boston Harbor, uh, uh, dating to about 4,000 years ago. Um, as you go up the river to catch an atromous fish, there are stone weirs, uh, but the weirs that were important in terms of trapping fish along the coast, as well as uh, fishing from uh, dugout canoes. And one of the things they liked to do was night fishing. So they would set fire within the canoe, a controlled fire, the light would attract fish, and would make it easier for them to uh, either spear or, or hook up with, with their nets. So the canoes were a very important part of their strategy uh, in terms of uh, coastal resources uh, because they could skirt the coast, uh, they can go uh, up the river valleys and so forth. Um, and I should tell you that these dugout canoes that were made by Native Americans here, were not just small little canoes. You think of birch bark canoes. That was more of a Northern New England uh, adaptation. Here we made dugouts. And what they did is they took a large tree, they fired the base of the trees. You could see here on the upper left of the schematic um, and um, probably pack it about waist high with mud. So the fire would not consume the whole tree, but they would control it at the base. And then taking stone hatches, axes, they would hack away at the charcoal, tumbling the tree, felling the tree, and then stripping the branches, stripping the bark, setting fire uh, to the log, 
uh, controlled and chiseled charcoal, burned charcoal chisel until they hollowed out the interior of the canoe. And I have to tell you, these canoes were literally ocean going vessels. Um, uh, the, uh, Roger Williams, who befriended the Narragansetts and founded Providence, Rhode Island, uh, you know, he, he tells us in his ethnohistoric record that uh, the Narragansetts had canoes that could fit 40 to people. And they were going across, we know from archaeological sites on Block Island, Long Island, Martha's Vineyard, that uh, the, the Native Americans here along the coast were going out to these islands extensively. And so much so from Connecticut that Native Americans on Eastern Long Island were more closely associated with the tribes of uh, uh, coastal New England, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts than they were to Western Rhode Island, which, which spoke a different language and had uh, different material cultures. So you would think it would be easier to go east-west on Long Island, but it was very easy to go back and forth. They had the vessels to do it, and we see the complex archaeological sites that show that kind of coastal adaptation. During the final stages before Europeans come here is called the woodland period starting about 3000 years ago. And we now start seeing the switch to crop cultivation, corn, beans, squash, the three sisters. We see it not only along the river valleys, but along the shoreline where good farming soils uh, 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 come in. We see now the advent of clay ceramics, the bow and arrow comes in, sites are located along good farmland along the shore. We see uh, longer growing seasons and fertile soil and a continuation of marine exploitation. But we now get larger villages. And when we look at our map at that time, look at the coastline, we now you know, see a, a real increase in the coast is not only stabled, but also the, the fertile lands uh, that are there and the ability not only to grow crops, but to continue the exploitation of abundant maritime resources are available there. Um, and again, part of that information comes from, you know, these kind of features. What you're looking at is kind of a, you know, early Native American refrigerator, okay? They dug a hole in the ground, they lined it with mats and grasses. You could see the lining stain, follow my cursor, um, and it's a bowl shape and inside, you know, they, everything from corn, beans, squash, nuts, you know, fish um, um, are all in here kind of preserved. The ground kept it a little cooler in the summertime and it kept it warmer in the wintertime. So the ability to store um, becomes extremely important, um, just as our ability with a mechanical machine, we call a refrigerator. Um, and these are the kind of house structures you would have seen at ham and acid uh by the way i forgot to mention at ham and acid we have uh, five archaeological native american archaeological sites recorded from the park alone uh so you may not as you use it, use the park for camping and recreational purposes you may not be conscious of the fact that um the site also has archaeological sites that are remnant of that past adaptation. So they built wigwams. The, these structures were covered with mats and furs uh, with all household implements in, inside, including sleeping cots, a, a central fireplace for cooking and warmth. Um, and the reason I, I, I want to explain this is because to make these structures, they took poles, usually young saplings, cleaned them off to, to make poles, secured them into the ground, tied them over, and then cover it with the, the bark and mats and furs uh, that they have. Um, and what I want to tell you as an archaeologist is we can still find them because everywhere they stuck that pole into the ground, well, it's wood. It rots. It decomposes. And again, if you could follow my cursor in this test pit, you could see within the subsoil this circular stain. Well, that's a post mold. You, it's, it's from that pole. We cut it vertically to be sure it's not a gopher hole or anything like that. It comes to a, a, a point. But once you can plot that, once you can plot those post stains, you can actually develop 
uh, an, you, you know the house. You could excavate inside the house. You could excavate outside the house. It's all available to you, sometimes from a stain in the soil, which helps us again understand adaptation. How are they living in the soils? How, I mean, how are they living on the land? You know, are they living in separate houses and small camps or are they in large villages? And how are they adapting to those resources that are now available to them? So we see uh, uh, and can document the nature of the settlements and the adaptation going on. So one of the interesting things about coastal archeological sites of Native American origin is that there are some things missing. And one of the things missing are lobsters and crabs. We do not, even with preservation, as good as it is in these shell bins and where we see even fish scales, we do, say, we do not see the shell of lobsters or crabs. They have not been really fully recovered. So is it a question, archeology, span is it a question of preservation? Were they not utilizing it? Is it differential treatment? And what I mean by that is maybe they're discarding lobsters and crabs away from shell middens or using them separately in different areas that do not, we do not find in, in, in the basic archeological contents. We know they're here in great Europe, uh, abundance when Europeans come here. Um, so it could be a, a point of, um, what some have suggested over exploitation that did not rebound till later, but it's it's one of those you know uh, uncertainties. We know lobsters would have been here and crabs. They, we know they would have utilized it, but we don't find them archaeologically. Another thing we don't find are anadromous fish very often. Um, we know from fish weirs and other things that the fish are coming up the river every spring to spawn. Uh, but we have few archaeological sites where they have recovered. In fact, we have no salmon bones, and yet we know historically salmon were here. Um, we do find, however, sturgeon, and sturgeon have bony plates which help in their organic survival in the ground. Um, so we, we do know they're doing that. But many times we find non-anadromous fish that are not spawning. Um, but we also don't have many shell bins upriver. We see those mostly in the coastal areas where it enhances preservation of fish bones. So it could be again that we, um, um, it could be a lack of preservation um, as opposed to not being utilized. And again, it could be differential treatment. When you look at the, the Northwest Pacific coast, Native Americans, we know they're um, you know, their, their main subsistence was often uh, salmon. But what they did was kind of different in terms of the treatment of the salmon. Um, while uh, they would fish the salmon, skin it, dry uh, the, the meat, um, they would then take the fish bones, instead of putting them into their garbage heaps, if you will, or disposing of them, they would bring them back to the river and plant them in the riverbank with the idea is that the bones would erode into the water, go down river, reassemble themselves as a new salmon and come back up and spawn. It was a way, a ritual way of ensuring that salmon would always be a part of their environment. So even in the Pacific Northwest, we don't see many salmon bones. So it's interesting. It's not just organic preservation. It could be how humans utilize and, and treat certain uh, resources that might be different from others. When of course Europeans come here, um, a lot changes. Um, we know uh, in terms of um, diseases that were brought, displacement of, 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 of native populations to war, um, contact with, you know, the earliest contact was trade, but, uh, very early, uh, but soon in the 17th century, the English came here not to trade, but to actually live, to settle. And of course that brought about a period of time of coexistence uh, and eventually depossession, and, but ultimately survival. That Native Americans are still here today is probably one of the greatest miracles of American, of world history. 
um, considering the impacts uh, that occurred to them. Um, and um, what ended up happening with European settlements, Europeans now started to settle along the coast, led to conflicts like the Pequot War, King Philip's War, um, trade, the diseases came in that literally annihilated uh, the 80, 90% of, of the village. By the time the, the pilgrims already came here, there's some evidence that there may have been already at least three major epidemics so that Europeans were already looking at a decimated population and really the reason they were able to get a foothold onto this continent. This wasn't um, you know, a wilderness as we often were taught in school. It was, there were hundreds of thousands of people living here but the diseases uh, were, were, were decimated. Uh, the Pequot War, and of course, um, uh, the Pequot tribe, along with Kevin McBride, uh, um, uh, received a battlefield grant and did a, a, a major studies along the coast, not only associated with the Pequot War, but understanding better the, the adaptation of what happened along the coast at that time, the movements of people uh, and, uh, um, um, the displacement of, of native populations. So when you look in the, in the 17th century, uh, this is Fairfield County. Uh, you know, we have a number of, of native villages along uh, the coast, utilizing the adaptations of along the coast and, and the mouths of the major rivers. But as Europeans come in, Native Americans are moved inland, away from the coast, because Europeans now are settling uh, and uh, along those coastal uh, areas. And so you get uh, tribes like the Scattercook, the Pagusset moving inland, uh, the Pudatuck uh, moving inland because the coast is, is no longer available uh, to them. Um, so tremendous changes uh, going on and uh, not only uh, environmentally, but culturally. I I'm gonna leave you with this one story. This is not Native American, uh, but this is such a, wonderful way to, to teach archaeology of the coastline. This is the Ebenezer Story Tavern in, uh, uh, on the Thames River up uh, uh, in Norwich Preston area today. Um, the tavern was opened uh, during uh, in the 1770s, actually opened up during the American Revolution because of shipbuilding that was going on nearby. And it was a tavern that was used for uh, right into the 20th century. And what the the the, uh, the the story family after the you know with the tavern is out in the backyard there was a natural swale and what they did is from the, the garbage from the tavern was getting thrown into um, the swale and you see it here uh, within the, the schematic stone on the bottom this is the midden area of trash during the the taverns uh, you know uh, occupancy. This is fill that comes in later on. What's really cool about this is that when you look at the oyster remains in this tavern, beginning in the late 18th century, individual oysters are large. They're about the size of your foot. But when you look in the late 19th century, about a hundred years later, oysters are small. They're, you know, they're now about the, you know, the size of your, uh, smaller than your uh, uh, your cell phone. And that's because what we could see in that 100 year period was over exploitation of the environment, of the resources of the Thames River. You could see oysters get bigger as they grow. They get larger through time. But if you over exploit them, they don't get to live that long and they become smaller and the meat is smaller. So it's the same thing with, you know, Native American sites of that time period. It gives us a gauge in which we can um, see how different species were being used and exploited, and maybe some to over exploited in certain immediate environments. And so they have to shift to another uh, species. Um, it, it, it has profound lessons for today and how we use the land and especially along the coast.
So I'm just going to close with saying that part of the uh, this study, these studies are our partners at UConn Avery Point and of course uh, NOAA of the federal government, they have been involved with remapping the bottom of Long Island Sound, which has not uh, for, you know, and using it for dredging purposes and research purposes. And what we have found is not only shipwrecks, but potential sites of Native American origin that are now buried uh, within Long Island Sound. Uh, so these ongoing researchers uh, become extremely important. Today, we have over, you know, this is again, old map, 7,000 archeological sites recorded in the state of Connecticut, uh, the, both of European American origin, African American origin, and certainly 12,000 years of Native American origin. You could see how that coastline and Hammond Acid area is so well um, uh, occupied. So um, I'm gonna leave you with that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and, um, you know, just try to answer any questions you, you might have uh, uh, for me. But, uh, you know, thanks for coming on board. And uh, um, um, I hope you've enjoyed the experience. We already have a question about what the name of the tribe that would have inhabited Clinton. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, you mean the, the sites of the tribes? Uh, the, what tribe would have lived in the Clinton area? The name of the tribe. In the Hammond Acid area? Uh, they're asking about Clinton, so yeah. I'm sorry, Russ, can you write it out? <laughs> it's, in the, it's in the chat. Oh, let me, let me, let me go to the stat. Oh, wait, let me go there. In the question and answer. Oh, okay, great. Why don't we start with Karen and then I'll just move up. How's that? Because now I could read it, which I, I uh, forgive me, guys. I have a, a, a loss of hearing. I 50% lost my hearing when I was in the service. So I don't hear as well as I see. <laughs> and I don't see good either. But anyhow, Karen wants to know what other large animals were uh, in the sound, um, where the sound is now. Okay, so um, it, it was a coastal. Uh, it, it was a, not a coastal, I'm sorry. It was a glacial lake. So it's around the borders of that glacial lake uh, that we see. Uh, Mastodon, caribou, herds of caribou would have, would have gone up that, uh, the rivers uh, there, uh, um, especially the major rivers, um, searching for the grasses. And uh, we had large beavers uh, in, in post Pleistocene Connecticut, beavers the size of a bureau uh, large, uh, large animals. Um, so uh, uh, many of that megafauna that we talked about were, were here um, at, at that time. Um, and Native Americans would have exploited, uh, you know, certainly what, what was uh, what was available to them. But there were many uh, diverse. Uh, the Mashtaka Pequots in their uh, wonderful museum um, had a whole uh, area devoted to this with a number of the mounts of, of large animals, wolves and so forth, that would have been here at that time. Uh, from Lori, Russ mentioned that people should start, oh. Oh, no, okay, we'll skip Lori. Uh, Willard Island. Okay. If okay. Am the, I seeing uh, them all? If you look in Q and A, there's a there's a couple of. Oh, questions. let's look at Q and A. Uh, it, it, okay, so Clinton, in the Clinton area, you had kind of a um, understand. Okay, so understand that the concept of a tribe is a European political um, creation. Uh, what was here were a group of fluid um, villages, uh, people that were related to each other. Um, they get solidified. solidified. You, you know, it, it's hard to explain this. Uh, when Europeans came here, they wanted to deal with political leaders. And um, um, 
so tribes had fluid boundaries. So in the Clinton area, you would have had Quinnipiacs historically. You would have probably had, you know, the Hamanacid, smaller groups like the Hamanacid, groups like um, the Mohegans, Pequots coming into the area. Uh, so it was a very fluid area. Um, I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but there would have been a number of groups that would have been utilizing that whole coastline. It's really historically that we see uh, these political groups at the end of the, the final woodland period really solidify as we think of them today. The deed near Harriman Asset talks about Native American terms, not, not qua qua, which means in the forest by the sea. Does this sound right? It could very well be. I really don't know the answer to that. Um, um, I've never heard that term before, um, but it, it certainly could be a, a phrase that was used in the immediate area, but uh, it could very well be in the forest by the sea because it was a land, you know, there was forest as well as the shoreline and it would have been available to all of them, all the resources of both the forest and the coastline. There's another one back in the chat. Yes, uh, the, the, there's one there about erosion uh, of Hurricane Irene. That is very true um, uh, at Indian Neck. Uh, Hurricane Irene tore about 20 feet inland uh, of the coast and down. It really wrecked havoc along Indian Neck. Uh, and yes, uh, archaeological deposits of shell middens were in fact exposed. Uh, 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 and they were of a time period um, of the, what we call the late woodland. So it would have been the, that woodland period that I talked about, that later phase. Um, and of course, Indian Neck was a very important area, um, even into the historic period. It was part of the, um, uh, the Quinnipiacs um, um, and Matuiz, the Quinnipiac Sachem. Uh, had a had a, uh, a a village camp there, but also it was the site because at the mouth of the uh, Branford River, it was also the site of an early Dutch trading post um, that would have been at the at the early also at the early 17th century. So yes, today the state of Connecticut, working through the office of the state archaeologist and the state historic preservation office, have now signed an agreement with FEMA for emergency uh, um, um, remediation along the coast of Connecticut, not only for environmental resources, but for cultural resources, because every storm eliminates uh, archeological sites. And so uh, the, the stabilization uh, all involve archeology span uh, and the protections and uh, the, the the mitigations are of archaeological sites. Hurricane Irene was 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 devastating uh, in that area to archaeological sites as well as the landscape. I found it fascinating, you know, Nick, in, in the beginning when you were talking about the clothing that that people wore and people wear. Um, when I worked at Rocky Neck, we I found a sign in the basement of a uh, of a large building. And it said that uh, people that were not dressed appropriately were not allowed to swim at the beach. And it, it actually described that men had to be covered from their shoulder to their knee and women must be covered from their elbow to their knee. There you go. <laughs> yeah, times have changed, haven't they? <laughs> um, Tim has got a question here about the 1938 hurricane. Uh, oh, absolutely. The 1938 hurricane literally, uh, um, especially in Eastern Connecticut, uh, redefined the landscape and it would have destroyed many, many archeological sites. Uh, and, and as you say, uh, possibly uncovered some uh, that would have been available then. You know, 1938 was a little before there were uh, people collecting archaeological, you know, artifacts like stone tools, 
um, but we don't have a real good record of the archaeology of what was devastated back then. But I'll tell you one story, uh, and that has to do with uh, Stonington, Connecticut. Uh, and of course, you know, the hurricane came up and just literally wiped out uh, what was called uh, Napa Tree Point, where Watch Hill is today in Rhode Island. So that borderland at the mouth of the uh, Pawkatuck River. Well, out on uh, Napa Tree, there was a, 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 an army fort called Fort Mansfield. It was put there uh, at the turn of the 20th century because of the French, uh, excuse me, because of the Spanish-American War as, as protection of our coastline. Well, it became obsolete by the 1920s. It was mostly abandoned. So when the 1938 hurricane hit, it so destroyed that whole peninsula uh, that um, the fort that was there, the, um, uh, the, uh, the wharf, the docking area for the ship got driven inland and banged up a connect to the Connecticut coast where today Connecticut DEP has Barn Island uh, as a state park. Well, there's a part of that island we, we were going through and people ha found some, um, some wooden planks and different things. And, it, and we went out there with the, the DEP uh, conservation officers and what we found was the wharf. It got completely driven from Rhode Island and, 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 and Watch Hill to Barn Island. And you can go along the trails today at Barn Island, along the coastal trails, and you will see it's, it's marked um, remnants, about 50 feet uh, of remnants of what was once the wharf at Fort Mansfield. It's such a cool archeological site now because it not only talks about the history of military history, but the, the, the effects of a hurricane like the 1938 hurricane that is now part of Connecticut. That is pretty cool. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. So I wanna thank you. Um, I wanna thank everybody that's uh, tuned in and watched this today. I want to thank uh, Nick for all of the great information. This was extremely educational. And we also had, this was going on live on Facebook. And there are a lot of people that are talking about how great this is, how much they learned. Um, people from Vermont and Georgia. So uh, had a good crowd from across the area. I want to let everybody know one of the programs that we have coming up uh, in January. We're going to have a lecture series about uh, women leaders in conservation. So we've got, I think, uh, two or three of them are set and we're working on getting them. That's going to start January 9th at 10 o'clock. And then all of the Saturdays in January after that at 10 o'clock, we'll have uh, a different woman leader in conservation. So again, thank you, Nick. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. And I'm just going to end the uh, presentation. Unless, Nick, you have anything else? That's it. We, we thank everybody for coming on board and, and, and uh, persevering with us for the last hour. We really do appreciate it. All right. We're going to end now. Great. So long, everyone.